I do pretty much what this creature does. <laughs> of course, I don't hang from the ceiling, but I also work in a dark environment, and I use ultrasound. I use ultrasound to create black and white images of the heart to find out if something is wrong with the heart, maybe even your heart. In, in my talk, I want to give you a bit of an idea of what echocardiography is, as it is also called, why it is so fascinating. But I also want to show you how important it is for you, for you as a patient, and how important it is to train physicians to know how to interpret these images. But first, one important fact. At a meeting in 2010 in San Diego, a very important cardiology meeting, a physician stood up and presented some data from her institution from the US, saying that in her institution, 29% of studies were misread. Almost a third of all patients had some false reading on their exam, which led to patients being brought to the OR, where they shouldn't have been. Additional tests were performed, which obviously ha could harm the patient and have a burden on the healthcare system. And this truly sent ripples through the world of medicine and cardiology. Um, what was the consequence? Well, one consequence was that they kicked out a lot of the staff and brought in new trainers to train the physicians to perform echocardiography, and they also kicked out the one who presented the data. So I'm going to be very cautious with what I'm saying here, but I do want to give you the background information that most of the physicians that I know, if you talk to them, they know of at least one, two, maybe even more cases where something went wrong. But let me go back a bit. Let me just give you a bit of a feel for what echocardiography is, and I will give you my perspective of how echocardiography evolved. So when I was in med school, uh, at the beginning of med school, in the 70s even, um, those were the images we got at that time. And you will ask me, what does that have to do with the heart? And I must agree, it does not really look like the heart, but in a way it was the heart because it was this different form of representation. What we had was the motion against time, and it gave us information, and it was the first way of diagnosing some diseases we couldn't diagnose otherwise as good as with this technology, but it was just the beginning. When I was out of med school and I started my professional career in a rehabilitation center, uh, those were the images we got then. Now, you might say st still no uh, definite resemblance to the heart, but it was. This is one chamber, the other, the third, and the fourth. We would get a view of the chambers, we would cut through the heart. So very similar to taking an apple, cutting it in half, and what you would be seeing is just a cut plane. So a fascinating thing. We could see inside the heart. And the images were okay, but they were so good already that it really changed the way we made diagnostics in cardiology. Until then, what did we use? Well, we basically used auscultation. Auscultation is uh, you listen to the heart sounds. What you do is you use a stethoscope, and you're trying to figure out just from the beating of the heart, from the sounds, if something is wrong. It's like putting your head to the motor hood and trying to figure out what is wrong with your car. Now, you will probably agree that this is not always the best way to do it, and I'm sure you would prefer to open up the hood and take a look inside to see if something is wrong with the motor. But um, that's what echocardiography did. It opened the hood. It opened the hood to the heart, and we were looking inside. And, uh, this dramatically changed the way we would go about with diagnostics, and it, of course, is still a very important way to do it. But even more so, um, the problem with auscultation we have now is that people, the young doctors that come out of med school, can't perform auscultation anymore. Do you know why? Well, there's two reasons. The one reason is that they are not trained as good anymore because they're using echocardiography, but a major other reason is because they use iPods, they go to discos, and their hearing is simply not good enough. They lose, especially the frequency range where we need, uh, where some heart valve defects are, are, should be heard. So hearing is a problem, auscultation is a problem, and certainly echocardiography is uh, now much, much more superior than uh, auscultation. But let me go back to remember this image. This is the image we had when I was at the beginning of my training. And now I will show you how echocardiography looks when I perform echocardiography in the lab. 
This is echocardiography. Now, I hope you understand my fascination. It's like looking into a glass patient. You can see structures. For example, you could see here the mitral valve. You have your glossary. You can look up what this is. Here is another valve, the aortic valve. This is the heart muscle. You can even see the fibers of the heart muscle. So a fantastic way of seeing the heart in a way we haven't been able to see it before. And image quality is improving and improving and improving. But remember, this is a cut plane technique. What does that mean? It means it's only one display. You cut the apple only in one direction. You might be lucky to find the worm, but maybe the worm is somewhere else. So to figure out the three-dimensionality, we have to perform several of such uh, views and then kind of put them together in your head in a form of a mental reconstruction to figure out what the three-dimensionality of a pathology or of a structure is. So this is something which is very difficult to do for the doctors and which needs a lot of training. You have to understand anatomy, so it's not so easy. But even this is much easier now. Why? Because we have a technology we call 3D echo. And this is 3D echo. Now, we use special transducers where we can acquire a complete data set and then we can reconstruct it and get structures which look like this. This is the aortic valve again. Now you're looking from the top of the aorta down onto the, the valve. You can even appreciate that there's three cusps. So fascinating images, no question. And we can even get views which we call the surgical views. This is the kind of a view you would get as a surgeon when you open the left atrium and you look down on the valve, the valve which you're supposed to repair, for example. Now, you can see the different parts of the leaflets, wonderful. We can give this information to the surgeon. And you know what? This information is even superior than the information the surgeon gets when he opens the heart. Why? Because when he opens the heart, it better not be moving. So <laughs> the moving valve can only be seen with the help of echocardiography. So very fascinating images and truly something that has, uh, has changed and will change uh, the way we practice cardiology. But this is certainly not the end. What else can we do with echocardiography? It's going to space. This is an image of uh, Jim Thomas. He's one of the leading uh, experts in the field of echocardiography. And together with a number of other uh, persons involved and colleagues, he is training astronauts. This is Leroy Chow here. He's an astronaut. He was on several uh, missions uh, to the space shuttle. And he brought the, the ultrasound system up to space. And he's been doing it there, on himself, on his colleagues. And he was trained to do it. He was trained by these cardiologists. So what do we learn? We can even train astronauts to do it. Okay? They're not doctors. They're only astronauts. So <laughs> it's learnable. Now, where is the next big thing going to be? Where is echocardiography going to go from here? What is the big thing. Now, I hope I don't sound too much like Steve Jobs, but I want to show you where echocardiography will be in the 23rd century. Here. This is the Tricarder TR590, a wonderful device. It has all the gadgets. You simply place this on the chest of the patient, and you will get fantastic images, and you will already get the diagnosis. You just put it on there, and you know what is wrong with the patient. Here you can see it in use. This is Dr. McCoy from Star Trek. I'm sure uh, you, you recognize him, and he's using this device on Captain Kirk. As a matter of fact, he's using an even more advanced device, which is even smaller, and which is called the so-called alien scanner. So a, a device we will have to use in the future, I guess. And uh, just as a side note, do you know what he's using here? you know what this is? A salt shaker. So he was using a salt shaker in the sequel, and um, I'm going to try that out to my patients once to see what they say, but very fantastic way of doing a cardiography. And if you want to, if you want to use it yourself, it's here, it's on the internet. You can buy it for only $90. <laughs> so this is the future of echocardiography. Well, obviously this is just a little toy, but the truth is that we are already in the 23rd century. We have this available. This is the system we have. This is a handheld ultrasound device available on the market. 
Just one example, there's several systems. You can put it in your pocket, you can go to the patient, uh, maybe even at home to the patient on house calls, do it somewhere out in the field, wherever you want to do it, it's handheld. And um, a fascinating thing, because now it, you have a device in your hand where you can substitute it for the stethoscope. You don't need to listen. You can open the hood with a small device like this. There's only one problem. You know what the problem is? It's not the price. It's not the price. It's not so expensive. People are not using it. They're not waiting in line to buy it like the iPhone 5. Very simple, because they don't know how to use it because they do not know how to interpret the images. They're scared of doing it. They do not have training. And training is much more difficult than people might think it is. Here are some examples. This is a patient, he came into our lab, and he had shortness of breath, and we found out pretty quickly that his problem was an incompetent valve. Again, you can go to your glossary. And it means that the valve is leaking, and this is not good for the heart, obviously, and the problem was now, what do we do with this patient? What is wrong with the valve? Can it be repaired? What do we do with it? And this is a so-called transesophageal study, where we poke a tube into the patient's throat, and we kind of image the heart from the back. Okay, so this is what we do, and we get very good images of the heart valve, two-dimensional. And here is the valve. Now, I do not expect you to figure out what it is, of course, I mean, I might be able to train you because, remember, I can even train astronauts. But this is the valve, and the problem with this valve is this here. This little yellow polka dot. Do you see it here? See? This little polka dot. This is a small part of the valve which is ruptured and which causes leakage of the valve. Now, many of you, many of my colleagues, did not detect this. It's very difficult to see. To see this, you need training. Another example. Here is a patient who came in with fever. He had fever for three weeks. Nobody knew what it was. He went through several exams, even echo exams. This is what we found. We found a valve, which was very thickened, with little structures on the valve. The patient had what we call infective endocarditis, infection of a heart valve, a lethal disease untreated, and the prognosis gets worse and worse the later you make the diagnosis. You have to make the diagnosis earlier because otherwise the patient will die. This is important to detect. You need experience to see this. Another example, this is not an image of, I don't know, the beginnings of echo. Uh, it's just so poor because not all patients have good image quality. And here we have the problem to figure out if the heart is of normal size, the function is okay, and this is not so easy if you do not have experience, because what we as humans are able to do, we're better than machines. We have a visual recognition mechanism built into our head where we can kind of extrapolate, we can see things that are not there. Uh, we have this capability, and if you do not have the experience, you cannot see anything there. And this will make it difficult for you to make a diagnosis. So again, you have to see many images. You have to know a lot of anatomy, anatomy and, and many other things. So those are just some examples. Now, in this summer, I had the wonderful opportunity to going to a country which all of you should visit if you ever have the chance, and that is Costa Rica. Costa Rica is full of wildlife, diversity, jungles, volcanoes, and we walked through the jungle with our guide and looking for animals. Now, but you have to imagine, these animals are not sitting on every tree. They're really hidden somewhere. They're, they're camouflaged, basically, in the jungle. So we're walking through the jungle, and all of a sudden, our guide goes and says, here, here's an animal. And he points to this twig. And I go, I go, where? Do you see an animal on this twig? This is the actual photo. So I went closer and closer and closer. I put my glasses on. I tried to see where it is. Well, it's right here. This is the insect that was there, a so-called stick insect. Very well camouflaged in there. And then I talked to the guide and I said, how the hell do you see this? I mean, we're walking at a normal speed. There's millions of twigs, branches, leaves. You don't even look. All of a sudden, it's there. You should point to it. Well, he said, you know, I've been living in the jungle now for over 20 years, and I'm just trained to do it. Certain patterns, I don't know why it happens, it's just there. And this kind of, again, rang a bell. 
this is the way one has to go about. You need training for everything, especially for visual recognition. It's not there. You can't do it from one day to the other. So this is another problem we have. This is Dr. Issa Krisa. Issa Krisa lives in Tanzania, and he has a number of problems. Here he is with his family and with uh, some of his patients. His problem is that they have HIV in his country. And they have a lot of HIV. Over a million patients have HIV. And what happens is that it affects the heart. It affects the heart, and it causes cardiomyopathy. So they have a lot of these cases. But his real problem is that there is only one ultrasound in the whole region in the one little community hospital that is there. And he does not have training. So how do we reach these patients, uh, these, uh, these physicians? This is important. Well, together with a coworker of mine who is also here, Franz Wiesbauer, we, we founded a company and a pro started a project where we try to train physicians over the internet, telling them how ultrasound uh, should be made. And we give them many, many different uh, uh, lectures and things that should teach them over the internet. But the basic principle we noticed we had to do is we had to go away from the classic front-to-front -front kind of a teaching. We had to change our concept. And we borrowed that from the term entertainment, going from entertainment to edutainment, going to medutainment. So this was the concept we kind of developed. And uh, let me just give you a short example of how we tried to teach these people. Well, one thing we did is we used games. This is an example of such a game. Now, many of you will probably recognize this game. It was in a television uh, series maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It was called Dali Kick. And the idea behind it is that you have an image in the background and there's tiles in front, and these tiles constantly are removed and you have to figure out what the pathology behind it is by pattern recognition, little hints in the image that could give you a final diagnosis. And if you think you know what it is, you answer a question. If you get the question right, you get points. And if you don't get it right, you lose a life. Not your life, but it's the doctor's life. So how does that sound for a change? Um, so the lives he loses, uh, of course, uh, are negative rewardable, but he keeps on playing and playing and playing. And this has been a real experience. The people have been playing this nights and nights. You can see a high score list here. And um, it's really been a big success. So um, if you ever come to your doctor's office and you're waiting there and you don't understand why it's not your turn, maybe the doctor is somewhere in the back office playing this game. At least <laughs> we hope he is. So um, this is uh, the one of the ideas we're using. But we're using other ideas as well. We're using, for example, um, caseloads presenting many, many, many examples. You can only learn echo from images. So we provide millions of images, and we also have them involved into our clinical routine. We have them as friends. They want to be with us. They want to have no distance to the teacher. They want to be part of the routine. So we kind of broadcast almost our clinical routine work via webcast, and the technology is there, to these people so they can learn. Now, how has this actually turned out, well, this has been a tremendous, a tremendous experience for us, but also for the users. And it has been spreading like wildfire. Just two examples. This is Natasha. Natasha is from Serbia. She works in the eastern region of Serbia. And she has to serve a fairly large region, and there's no hospital. It's only outpatients, you can see, but they're very critically ill sometimes. And she sent us this mail with the image that I showed you previously, where she was able to diagnose a patient with a uh, main artery, the aortic artery, was about to rupture. Now, this is a lethal disease. If you do not catch that, bleeding, dead, over. Even though an even more senior physician had looked at her before, she made a misdiagnosis. She did not catch that, but she did. And she was proud, and I think she can be proud that she made this diagnosis. And another example. This is Krista. Krista is from Norway, and he lives probably the same place that uh, my speaker before was taking pictures of whales, somewhere up in Norway, I guess, in a region where there is nothing. 
There is practically nothing. There is no cardiologist. There is no specialist. He is a general physician, and he has to take care of the entire region. But he was really fanatic about echocardiography, and he's uh, over 60, so we don't only have young uh, people working for us, but we have 60. He was over 60. And the thing was that he learned echocardiography, and he was able to diagnose a patient with endocarditis. Remember the disease I showed you before with the infection of the heart valve? And he was the first to diagnose this disease outside a hospital in the northern part of Norway. So I think he'd be very proud, and we are too, because we're happy that we were kind of involved in this whole thing. Now, where is all this going? Where is all this going? Well, basically, we want to now teach more people, and we are now working together with the um, a group called Doctors Without Borders. You know them all. Uh, they are having a lot of humanitarian aid all over the place. And we are teaching and training these doctors to go out and to train the people there. So this is going to be the next step, and maybe we'll even be able to train physicians on place there. So this is a big project we're working on right now. But in conclusion, what is the take-home message here? I think the take-home message is that it's not all about technology. Images are important. The quality of images is important. But it's the human resource. It's the doctors. It's the physicians. Those are the ones who ultimately make the decision. We will not have a tricorder, at least not in the foreseeable time, that is able to make a diagnosis just by a click. So we need the human resource. We have to train our doctors. So just remember this the next time you go to your doctor. Thank you.